bienvenidos a este nuevo encuentro del año 2021 del ciclo de charlas de Global Distinguished Speaker organizadas por el capítulo argentino de la SPWLA. Mi nombre es Marta D'Angela y presido orgullosamente este capítulo. Formamos parte de un equipo de evaluadores de formaciones de alto nivel profesional y fundamentalmente un excelente grupo humano. Si quieren indagar más sobre nuestras actividades, los invito a visitar a nuestro sitio, al sitio de la SPWLA, y donde van a encontrar dentro del de, eh, link de América Latina eh, las actividades de nuestro capítulo. Además, tenemos nuestra propia casilla de correo, eh, a través de la cual nos vamos comunicando constantemente y mantenemos a, todo, a todos los eh, interesados eh, informados de todas las actividades que hacemos. Además tenemos un sitio en LinkedIn donde también eh, vamos subiendo contenidos y, y novedades y actividades eh, y también nos acordamos a las nuevas a las nuevas eh, a los nuevos sectores etarios que estamos incorporando, a las nuevas generaciones, a través del Instagram, tenemos Instagram hace poquito, así que los invitamos a que nos sigan, búsquennos como spwla-ar. Bueno, al tema membresías, siempre recordemos que los que se asocian en cualquier forma, como miembros, que hagan referencia a nuestro capítulo, para así los podemos sumar. Hay varias formas de eh, asociarse a la SPWLA. Eh, nuestro país pertenece al Grupo 2, donde las membresías son bastante más económicas, así que invitamos a todos los profesionales que se unan eh, a nuestro capítulo, lo van a hacer por una membresía de 40 dólares, mientras que eh, para otros países es de 100 dólares. También existe la posibilidad de afiliarse o como no miembro o, o como miembro de un evento. En este caso es eh, gratuito y es lo que a veces los que nosotros solicitamos que tengan eh, para poder acceder a nuestras, este, a nuestras eh, charlas a través del de, eh, canal de YouTube que tenemos. Es algo nuevo, que antes eh, la membresía de estudiante era de 15 dólares, ahora es eh, para el grupo 2 es de, dos de 6 dólares, perdón, 6 dólares anuales. Y eh, como nuestro objetivo en el futuro es formar el eh, capítulo estudiantil, realmente incentivamos a los que puedan a que se asocien a este, eh, en este formato, porque de esta manera podremos, eh, cuando tengamos una masa crítica de de miembros, eh, podremos eh, abrir nuestro propio eh, capítulo estudiantil. Bueno, además de eh, las charlas técnicas que hacemos, abrimos un, un espacio que llamamos Un Poco Más Humano. Cuento que Un Poco Más Humano es un tema de una banda eh, de rock que, que yo sigo, y realmente eh, lo que hacemos es, eh, en este espacio, no trabajamos tanto los temas técnicos, eh, no tanta porosidad, no tanta saturación, eh, sino que nos estamos dedicando a poner temas eh, relacionados con recursos humanos, desarrollo de, de habilidades blandas, entrevistas a personalidades, a, a otros eh, profesionales, pero que nos cuenten sus, historias, sus, sus eh, experiencias, por eso lo llamamos un poco más humano, ¿no? y otros intereses que, como dice el nombre, nos recuerden ser un poco más humanos. Nuestra próxima actividad, dentro de este, de este ciclo, eh, vamos a hacerle una entrevista a Josefina Vizcaíno, que es una geóloga, eh, y que nos vamos a contar un poco su experiencia como en for de formación de posgrado en el exterior. Hizo un trabajo, eh, un máster, una maestría en sedimentología y geoquímica, de una playa no. tropical del ordovísico de Nueva York. No y por favor, cierren los, pueden cerrar las, los, los micrófonos. Eh, bueno, como les decía, Josefina eh, regresó hace poquito, regresó antes en junio eh, de Estados Unidos, y la invitamos para el 7 de agosto próximo 
para que nos cuente, un, un, nos haga un resumen corto de, de, de qué fue hacer técnicamente, pero nos interesa que esté a disposición nuestra para hacerle las preguntas, para que nos ayude y que ayude a los otros profesionales, eh, contando cómo hizo para aplicar, cómo hizo para, o sea, cómo vivió eh, este tiempo que encima el, más del 50% lo, lo vivió en pandemia. Es el miércoles 4 de agosto eh, del 2021, tengo que chequear, me parece que es el 7, pero no importa, lo chequeamos. Eh, van a recibir a través del mail el, la invitación, también vía Teams. Y bueno, ahora sí eh, le doy la palabra a nuestro moderador, nuestro moderador hoy, que es hoy. Eh, Pablo Patetti, que es eh, Senior Petrophysicist en eh, Winter Aldea y además es un activo colaborador del, eh, del grupo de tecnología de nuestro capítulo. Así que, eh, Pablo, todo tuyo. Gracias, Marta. Buenos días a todos. Uh, eh, bueno, una vez más, gracias por eh, eh, unirse a, a esta presentación, por aceptar la invitación. Eh, el título de la presentación de hoy eh, es The Benefits and Dangers of Using Artificial Intelligence in Petrophysics, los beneficios y los prejuicios de utilizar inteligencia artificial en petrofísica. Eh, la inteligencia artificial es un método de análisis de datos que aprende de los datos, identifica patrones y hace predicciones con la mínima intervención humana posible. Básicamente la inteligencia artificial resuelve los problemas escribiendo su propio software o sus propios algoritmos. La inteligencia artificial aporta muchos beneficios a la evaluación petrofísica, utilizando, eh, utilizando estos casos de estudio, unos casos de estudio que nos va a presentar Steve en unos momentos, describe varias aplicaciones exitosas. El futuro de la inteligencia artificial tiene aún más potencial. Sin embargo, si se usa descuidadamente, existen peligros potencialmente graves. Para entender mejor el concepto, abordaremos el estudio con un enfoque petrofísico, petrográfico, en micro y nanoescala, geoquímico y mineralógico. Este camino conceptual nos permitirá comprender la for de forma rigurosa las relaciones entre las propiedades macro y las características que controlan dichas propiedades. Eh, nuestro invitado de hoy, eh, Steve Cuddy, eh, tiene un posgrado en petrofísica en la Universidad de Aberdeen y también tiene una licenciatura en física y una licenciatura en astrofísica y filosofía. Escribe software de inteligencia artificial y tiene 45 años de experiencia en la industria eh, petrolera como petrofísico y ha trabajado para empresas como Schlumberger, BP y Baker Hughes. Es el inventor de la función fractal foil que describe la distribución de fluidos en el, de, en el modelo de yacimientos y en reconocimiento a su servicio sobresaliente de la SPWLA, Steve recibió el premio al servicio distinguido en 2018. Eh, eh, durante la presentación... Eh, eh, por favor, eh, mantenga sus eh, micrófonos silenciados y las preguntas pueden ir escribiéndolas en el chat durante la presentación. Vamos a tener una sesión de, eh, de Q&A al final de la misma. So, um, I give the word to Steve. So, Steve, uh, welcome to our chapter. Um, please, uh, go ahead. Right, I'll uh, I'll put the uh, the pointer on so you can see what I'm pointing to. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me back to Argentina. I was there a couple of years ago to see your amazing glaciers and mountains, and I'm here virtually today. Now, this presentation is based upon uh, a, the, a paper that I give at the uh, annual conference to the SBWA last summer, and has been recently Sorry, updated. Uh, Yes. Uh, would you mind sharing the, the, the screen? Uh, I think it's not up yet. Can I see? Can you see that? Um, yes. Yes. Perfect. No. No. Right. How about that? Is that okay, everybody? That's perfect. Thank you, Steve. Right. Okay, well, um, just to say this is based on a paper from last summer and has been recently updated in this uh, magazine, this journal, and I will give you the links to the, both of those 
uh, during the presentation. So this is a, an outline of this presentation today. I will um, I will explain what I mean by artificial intelligence, which is a, a controversial uh, statement. And but the, the main drive of this uh, presentation is to give you some petrophysical case studies for the oil industry. And I will go through five case studies, water saturation equations, nuclear magnet residence, shear logs and so on. And I will, I will tell you more about the background to artificial intelligence, the difference between narrow intelligence, general intelligence and true, what is true artificial intelligence. And at the last part of my presentation, I will tell you about some of the dangers of artificial intelligence. And when I say dangers, I'm not talking about you losing your hard drive and your pet physical data. I'm talking of, of an end of civilization event, really. So what is artificial intelligence? Well, I prefer Alan Turing's. I prefer Alan, Alan Turing's definition, and it is very simply stated as getting computers to imitate human intelligence. So, for instance, if you're leaving the office and your colleague says it's raining outside, I recommend you take a brolly, an umbrella then that will be human or natural intelligence. Now, if your smartphone spoke to you and said, it's raining outside, I recommend you take an umbrella, that is that is artificial intelligence, as simple as that. Now, what is data, uh, artificial intelligence? It's, it's, it's a, a kind of data analysis. It loops at the data, it learns from the data, it finds patterns in the data, and then it is able to make solid predictions without much human intervention. Now I'm going to tell you today about three generations of AI. The first generation of AI was, was called expert systems or rule-based systems. And these go back to uh, 19, the 1970s and, and before. And it was used in simple petrophysics, such that if you had a, st uh, a statement, if the porosity is less than two porosity units and the shaliness is more than 80 percent, um, then it is, it, it is uh, probably a shale. OK, so that was that's a rule based system by getting the experts together in a room to come up with with the, the algorithms. I use an analogy with, with chess because chess has always been applied to computers and artificial intelligence. And back back in the in the, in the last millennium in 1997, IBM's Deep Blue beat the grandmaster Gary Kasparov at chess. That was amazing for the computers, but then people said, well, what is so special about that? It's like comparing a tractor with a farmer. The tractor may be more powerful, but the farmer has got insight and creativity, and I'll return to that. Now, in the second generation of AI, which is used in all of the case studies I show you today, is, is often called machine learning. It loops the data and it comes up with predictions. I'm going to tell you today about, about the evolution of water saturation equations, looking at nuclear magnetic resonance and so on. Now, carrying on with the, the chess analogy, Google's AlphaZero was a self-taught computer program. It just, it didn't have the rules. It looked at, just looked at the a game and played itself. And after a couple of minutes, it, it developed a strategy that it could easily beat all first generation AI, the IBM Deep Blue and so on. <laughs> now, chess as analogy is good because in chess, cheating is obviously frowned upon and if you have access to a computer while you're playing chess then that that is a, a, a good advantage now in chess tournaments how do they check for cheating right well most chess players are good because they remember a lots of previous moves they do not make creative moves in an actual game so <clears throat> in competitions they look and watch out for the software or for the, 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 the um, 
chess players making creative moves as an indication of cheating, creativity there. And then I'll go on to tell you about third generation AI, which is the future, which is very interesting, but has got lots of dangers associated with it. So, artificial intelligence only requires two things. You, you just tell it what you want, and this is what you call it, its goal or its fitness functions, as I will explain. And you give it the data, and that is all. There is minimum human intervention. <clears throat> it doesn't need prior knowledge of the pedophysical response equations. There are no parameters to pick and no cross plots to make. So what is the data? For, for petrophysics, it's everything. Obviously, it includes the electrical logs, which you learn to the well, on cable or on drill pipe, like the gamma ray, the density log, caliper, etc. You also give it the core data, like porosity, core water saturations, as I'll explain. <clears throat> you give it depth, measure depth, and TVD sub C, true vertical depth. And these are probably the most important parameters. You can also give it the gas data, the gas chromatography data, which is an essentially a free measurement because it is acquired in every well for health and safety reasons. <clears throat> we can also give it the drilling data, rate of penetration and so on. And as, as I'll show you, you can give it images as well. Now, you don't have to worry about giving it too much data and you don't have to worry if you give it rubbish or garbage, as I will explain later. So let's be clear, what is the, the n dimensional data? Well, n, when n is one, this is one dimensional, is an histogram or a bar chart, as you see here, a frequency chart. <coughs> Petrophysicists often use two dimensional charts, a cross plot. Cross plots show you information plotting neutron porosity against density porosity, teases out information about the rocks. Three-dimensional data is very difficult to display on a flat screen, but we can cheat by giving it a color. So in this three-dimensional shot here of uh, porosity against density, the z-axis or the third axis is the gamma ray, and so on. You can have as many dimensions as you want, provided they're all related. And they're related probably by depth, or they could be related by time of acquisition. So this is the database we give to the AI. So second generation AI, what we need to do is define the problem. We have to say what we want. We want you to determine permeability or we want you to determine water saturation. And this is called the fitness functions I will explain. You give it access to the data, then the computer guesses an answer, then through successive iterations, evolves the best answer. So you've got your code, you randomly change the computer code, and you look to see whether it has solved your problem better. In other words, is it fitter? If it is not, you just ignore that iteration. If it is better, you keep it and you iterate again. And you can do this thousands of times a second. So let me sh explain that showing the first case study. This is a, a Middle East carbonate reservoir, as shown on the right. We've got the matrix carbonates, and we've got some shale on the left in green and the hydrocarbon on the right. In addition, we've got very good core data. The core porosities are shown in green and the core water saturations are shown in red. Now, the client wanted, wanted us to derive a bespoke shale stand equation. It wanted us to derive a specially the designed water saturation equation, which would work best in this reservoir. And it was to be derived from, from resistivity and the gamma ray logs. 
The client also wants an independent check of the of the skull, the special core analysis parameters M and N, the saturation exponent and the cementation exponent. They're using the in the in the uh, saturation equation as I'll show you. Now these water saturations were high quality. How do we know they're high quality uh, core water saturations? Sure, right? Because the core plugs were taken from the center of the core away from the damaged edges which could be affected by by mud filtrate. The analysis was done with Dean and Stark, top of the range. The the mud was uh, was oil based mud, so it wouldn't affect the water we were seeing in the cores and the mud was was also doped so that we could ensure that there was no contamination. So what do we want to do here? We wanted to derive an equation, a water saturation equation, so that the resistivity predicted water saturations, the resistivity log, are as close as possible to the core derived water saturations, which we believe re represented reality. In this simple example, we started by giving it some constraints. We said only find a water saturation equation, which is a function of porosity, resistivity, and the volume of shale. Now this is because the, the water saturation in the rock depends on two things, the conductivity of the water in the pores and also the excess conductivity of the shales. So we give it an indication which way we want it to go. Now the AI went away and could possibly reinvent the Arch equation or the Indonesia equation and so on to give a specific equation for that field. So this is what it could have come up with, these equations, and these are the parameters. Let's, let's just have a look at the result. Essentially, this is calibrated to the core water saturations, as shown here in this track. We've got a good match between the AI SW in blue and the water saturations, as you would expect because we're calibrated to that, but also we have got good predictions of the low water saturations and the high saturations. Remember, the fitness function in this case was just go away and find the equation yourself. We don't give you any clues. Find the best equation so that the resistivity derived water saturations, shown in blue, match the core saturation, then tell us the nature of the equation. Now, this is the equation it came up with. We were in conductivity space here, which is the inverse of resistivity. And it says the conductivity is equal, as I said, to the conductivities of the water, which is essentially the, the uh, salinity of the waters, plus an excess conductivity due to the shales. So this is the equation we give to the client. But in addition, it was able to derive these parameters or constants M and N. So it derived the cementation exponent and the saturation exponent to three decimal places. Now both of these are derived at reservoir conditions because the resistivity log is lowered into the well to be across the reservoir and, and also the porosities are measured at reservoir conditions. Now it's very difficult in the laboratory to calculate the saturation exponent at reservoir conditions. So this is the result and the, uh, the, the these parameters were available well in advance of the laboratory analysis, which came months later and were very similar. Right, let me give you a, a second uh, example now. The second case study, now, th this is where we're going into nuclear magnetic resonance. And I'm going to tell you a gas field on the UK continental shelf, which had an oil problem, as I'll explain. Now, we had a wealth of data here. We could give lots of data to the artificial intelligence. We had the gamma ray, we had the resistivity logs, shallow and deep, and we had the different porosity logs. We had the, the total gas chromatography data, we had the uh, core oil saturations and the core gas saturations as shown in, as green and red here. And we've got the, the NMR. 
long and short. And the computer process interpretations on the right, as you can see, we've got lots of shales in green, the sands are in yellow, and we've got thin bedded coal beds in black and calcite cementers in blue. So it's a very complex reservoir. The problem with this field is it was drilled because of its gas, but it found oil. Now this was a problem because there is residual oil pockets that remain inside the gas reservoir. As shown, and this is very viscous, as shown by this beaker full of oil. Very viscous, and if this was produced to the well, it would block the production tubing. <clears throat> So the, the client needed to identify in real time which beds had oil and which had gas so he, he, could, he or she could selectively perforate just the gas zones. Well, as you know, as, as petrophysics, you can, you can actually identify gas from oil by looking at the density neutron separation. But this was not possible in this field because the beds were so thin, and also it was a very shaly formation. So this is where the NMR came in. Now this is the, the NMR, the Nuclear Magnetic Resonance. I don't have time to, to explain nuclear magnetic resonance, but basically, essentially, this measures how hydrogen atoms respond to a magnetic field. And what we get out is like an image it's a distribution, a T2 distribution, or sometimes called the spectrum, like that. And this is this is shows you the rate that the uh, the hydrogen atoms are relaxing. Now there's a wealth of information there. This T2 distribution is responding to the total volume of rock. It's responding to the the, the, the porosity, effective and total. It's responding to the different kinds of of fluids, hydrocarbons, mud filtrate, the waters, and also the, the clays and shales. So it's, it's a wealth of information that it's trying to un unravel. Now, conventional analysis of NMR uses either the Coates or the SDR methods. The Coates methods looks at this distribution and looks at the ratio of the area under the curve here compared to that. The SDR looks at the T2 cutoff in log space and, and uses that as information about the NMR. And all that information about the reservoir is contained in those very simple cutoffs. So we want to use more of this the information inside the T2 distribution. So what we, we told the AI to, to, to do, to go away and find in the uh, data space, find a relationship between this spectra and the core derived oil and gas saturations. And this is in a similar way to our face recognition works. You're looking at the pattern and you're trying to just find a relationship and to say whether it is most likely oil or gas. So then based on the calibration to the core, then it predicts a continuous curve throughout the well in all beds, the amount of gas and oil saturations. So again, we have a fitness function, a goal for the AI. We say determine the spectrum that gives the best match to core for the oil and gas saturation in the reservoir. And that's all we do. We give it a goal and we give it the data. So this is what we call a real time identification of gas and oil zones. So in these tracks here, you see the the core derived oil saturations and the gas saturations in red. And the AI goes away and it calculates a continuous curve as shown here based on that calibration. And this is in a similar way as as face recognition is used. So now, if you look at this, because the human eye is, is very powerful, you can see there is a relationship between the shaley beds and the distributions, as you see here from the NMR. Where it's shaley, when we, we've got the, the distributions are bunched to the left. 
where we've got good porosity and different hydrocarbons, it, it moves to the right. So the human eye can see there is a relationship, but we tell the AI to go away and do it as precisely as possible. Find the best relationship between the shape of these images and the core derived saturations so that you can make a continuous prediction for the client. So based on that, the NMR identified here intervals of high oil saturations and low gas saturations, and this interval had to be avoided and was not perforated. But lower down in the well, deeper in the well, we have intervals which have, have we've got predicted gas saturations and low oil saturations, and these, these were perforated. Now the client, as, as always, didn't want to just believe the AI alone. So in addition to the AI, it looked at the, the free measurement, the total gas, to confirm these predictions, and also ran in these wells on wireline the boreal fluid analyzer and was able to confirm that these, these intervals were oil and these were gas, rather than having to test with this expensive measurement all the intervals. So this well was perforated as shown, and, and, and the client was very happy that this was just a, a good result, just producing gas. So let me tell you more about the AI engine. The data analysis learns from the data, it identifies the patterns and makes predictions with a minimum of human intervention. There has to be some mathematics behind it. And um, we have tried neural networks, genetic algorithms, fuzzy logic, random forests. These are, these are the engines which, which the AI uses. Now AI, avoids the problem of garbage in, garbage out. It does this, as I will explain, by swamping the answer with good data, by using fuzzy logic, as I will explain, and avoiding, you avoid least squares regression. So first of all, uh, fuzzy logic. This is one of the, 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 the powerful engines behind artificial intelligence. This is fuzzy logic, okay? Um, at the top, we, we've got things which are not very fuzzy or crisp, and, and as it varies here. So things, when you first look at them, are black and white. Very simple, it's black or it's white. The ancient Greeks, they, they had the idea of a classical logic X or not X. A statement is true or it's false. A defendant is guilty or not guilty, right? But as you move down, into reality, you realize there's a bit of a fuzziness creeping in. Political parties could be the left or the right, or they could be somewhere in between. When you, when you watch a movie, there are good, clear goodies and baddies, but some of the characters are somewhere in between, a good heart or whatever. Now, when you look at the map, you see mountains and you see valleys with glaciers, right? And, uh, but where do the mountains start and the valleys end? The petrophysicists want to know what is net and what is non-net. And we can do that better by using fuzzy logic, which is the inverse of Chris logic. As I said, this presentation was supposed to be given last summer. OK, and this is a photograph of the, of the conference center. The sky there, is this a, a clear sky or is it cloudy sky? Well, as you know, it's somewhere between. The answer is never black and white. So. I was supposed to give my presentation there. Uh, something happened. Uh, you've probably heard of the butterfly effect. There's a butterfly in the Amazon basin, flaps its wings, and it causes a tornado in Texas. Well, the butterfly effect last year was more dramatic than that. There was a single mutation in a single DNA, in a single bat, in a, in a cave somewhere, and it caused, it caused 7 billion people's lives to be turned upside down. And I'll come back to that point later, it's important. So fuzzy logic, it is a, an extension of the logic of zero and one. We know in reality things are not clear. And, and if you have a grayscale between one and zero, you, you have a, a more powerful result. 
Fuzzy logic looks for correlations in data space, but asserts there is valuable information in the fuzziness. And this avoids, as I'll explain, the problems of outliers and noise. Fuzzy logic says that any interpretation is possible, but some are more light than others. If you have a piece of rock, it could be a shale or it could, it could be a sandstone, but more information you give it, you're more likely to say it's a sandstone or a shale. The mass be behind fuzzy logic is, is straightforward and is freely available, and I can give that to anybody who wants to, to use that. Now, the other thing you need to give the AI is, is, the, is the data. Then the data is in this n-dimensional relational database. And in this data space, it uses what we call a KNN algorithm to, 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 to find relationships. This is one way it does. So if you take this very simple cartoon here, say you've got in your data space, and we're just showing, say, two dimensions here, and we've got different lithofascies of sand, shale, and carbonate. Now, what you, a human being would do would say, well, if I've got on the cross plot a shale point and a point is very close to that point, it is most likely a shale, but it could be a sandstone. And it, it works out the probability, obviously, based on the distance between the, the factors type and the data point. In addition, fuzzy logic weights these lines depending on the likelihood of an association. So, for instance, if the gamma ray is found to be highly correlated, it's very crisp, not fuzzy, with shaliness, the vector will have more influence on the AI decision compared to, say, the caliper reading the same depth. But the caliper is still used because that may tweak the answer. So let me show you a, a third case study, real case study here. This is um, a large uh, North Sea field. It's got 30 wells. It's got lots of data. We've got gamma rays and um, Compressional sonic shown in red in all the wells. And the interpretation again is on the right, showing the shales in green, the sandstones, the waters in blue, and the hydrocarbon in, in, in red there. Now, what, what we had 30 wells with extensive data, but only four wells had recorded shear velocity data as shown in blue here. Now, shear velocity data, as you know, and geophysicists know, is very useful, and drillers also know, because it gives you information for the rock property analysis. It also gives you information about well bore stability. So the, this, the client for this field wanted to have shear data in all 30 wells. Now, it can't create shear data from nothing, but it can give its best guess, best likelihood of shear based on the other curves. So we wanted shear data in all the wells, but also we wanted to fill any gaps as shown at the top here, and we wanted to correct any cycle skips or poor data. So what did we say to the AI? We said well, the fitness function, the goal, determine a relationship so that the, the predicted shear velocities are as close as possible to the log-derived shear velocities. And we said in this case, the predicted shear log should be a function of all the conventional logs, all the drilling data, and the gas chromatography data. And the AI went away and evolved a relationship, and not only give you the relationship, but explained how it derived it. It's not a black box. So this is, shows you the answer here. The recorded log is shown in blue in this track. And the predicted log is shown in, in green. So it's, it, it lies very well over the top there. It's a good match and also filled in the gap at the top. Now, you see it's got a good match in, in the shaly beds and in the thick sandstones, but there are intervals where it is poor. It is, it is not the same. Now, the client thought that the predicted logs from the AI were actually better than the recorded logs. How can a, re a predicted log be better than the recorded logs that it was used to calibrate against? 
Now, this is because the air had access to all the data, not just the, the um, compressional sonic, but also the other logs, which included high resolution data, high vertical resolution data, like the microresistivity. So in the first pass, the, the AI calculated a relationship in data space between the logs and the, the, the type of fascias, the shales or the sands, and was able to, to predict in the thick beds. Now in the thinner beds, it was able to first of all pick the, the uh, thin beds because it had, had our resolution data, and from that information was then able to predict the correct shear velocity because it knew what it really should be from the thick beds. So it gave a good prediction there. Now I want to tell you about linear regression and artificial intelligence because we want to avoid linear regression. It's very good for uh, very simple statistics, but has problems. It can be used to find relationships bet between, between logs. And how it works is that it, it minimizes the error between the, your two cur your curves in data space and the and the say the line you're trying to find. But what it does, it 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 minimizes the square of the errors. It's trying to minimize all these squares to find the best line. So it's like in the right cartoon here. It's trying to it uses each of these springs. Now, this, the points which are furthest in the line will have the most tension in the spring and will have most influence over where the line goes. So let's see what the impact of that is. So a point which is a long way from, from the line will have an unfair influence on the result. And this is what we say that is very undemocratic. It's not using all the points equally. So yeah, as I showed here, 10 times further away, I will have 100 times the weighting or influence on the line. Now this is, this is a bias, which is very difficult to remove manually. And if you did it manually for every point, which would be possible, you would introduce a human bias. And not only that, these points could be valid points. They could be coal beds or calcite stringers. They may not be noise or poor data. So what we say is use all the data. So you keep all the data and you minimize the, the linear distance between the points and the line, not the square of the distance. And in this way, the random noise, if it is truly random, will be swamped by valid data. Now let me show you uh, the fourth case study, another North Sea uh, field, a, a, a large field where we want to predict permeability, the holy grail of petrophysics, to be able to predict permeability, <laughs> which is very difficult. And again, we've got uh, we've got shown here. We've got the caliper, the gamma ray, the porosity logs, density neutron, and sonic. We've got the computer processed interpretation on the right, and we've got. Uh, the permeability data from the core, and we want to predict predict the uh, the core the permeability based on a calibration to the core permeabilities. So first of all, the AI goes away and it calculates the most likely fascies as shown here. So it picks the most likely fascies from from all the logs, and then based on the fascies type. And the, and the logs, it predicts the permeability. And it says that any interpretation of permeability is likely, but some are more likely than, than, uh, than others. And because you're taking all the information from the start of, the, of your prediction to the end, you, 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 you can predict AI, can tell you how confident it is, shown like a, with a, what you call a heat map here. This is the confidence of the predictions. So where you've got uh, red, you've got a high prediction. Where you've got blue, you've got a low prediction. So it gives you a confidence as well as predicting the permeability. Now, there are many ways to predict permeability you've, you've come across. So how do we know that this AI permeability 
is, is any better than the other methods. So let's, what we need is a beauty contest. And we'll, uh, we did this for this field. Just to say that the, the log and core permeabilities typically represent two feet for the logs and maybe two inches for the, for the permeability, so that's an issue. And if you predict permeability, you, it must be correctly predicted so that it will be upscaled correctly for your reservoir model. This means it must have the same distribution or dynamic range as a core data. What do I mean by that? This is the dynamic data shown for the core permeabilities, typically a Gaussian distribution. The predicted permeabilities using least squares will give you a very good prediction of the average permeability because that what it does. It, it's a mean, but it's very poor given the extremes. You need to know your eye permeabilities because there's, they're your main conduits to flow, and you need to know your low permeabilities because in the reservoir model, they're the main barriers to flow. So how does AI compare in this beauty contest with least squares? So we've got 15 cord wells. 15 cord wells, and the colour in these plots represents each of those cord wells. And we're, sh we're showing a, an histogram showing you the, uh, the, the core distribution, distribution there. It's bimodal, so we've got a lot of high permeabilities, which the client liked, but it also had low permeabilities, which we, which we needed to um, identify as well. Now, the the uh, from linear regression, this is the answer. Again, it is very good at predicting the average permeability, but it's very poor at giving the shape or the, the binomial distribution, which is, is clearly shown on the AI prediction. <laughs> also, if your distribution is incorrect, when you upscale, as people, Petrophysicists to know if you upscale a poor distribution, you get a very poor permeability when you go to larger scales. I want to tell you about the difference between narrow and general artificial intelligence. Narrow AI is like the apps on your smartphone. They're very good at predicting the weather, converting currencies, or ordering a coffee for you. But you wouldn't use your, your coffee app to predict the weather, would you? So this is these what you've got in your smartphone is, is, is AI, but it is very basic. In fact, AI specialists say that an earthworm has got far more intelligence than the smartest AI at the moment, and that is because it is narrow. Narrow AI is very good at doing particular tasks, right? But, in the, but what we want to do, we want AI like humans can, that can do many things, be the jack of many trades. We want it to be able to play chess and do petrophysical analysis, such that a human may be able to see the data structure in, in chess and realize how it makes a decision and then use that information to make pe better petrophysical analysis as an example. So if in the future, you can you can predict, do many different things. You're going to get a better prediction like a, like a human being would do. So general AI, it learns from one specialist area and applies it to another. By definition, this is creativity. It's, a, it's, it's, an, it's able to produce something completely original. And that is where we're moving to. General AI is true AI. <clears throat> In actual fact, general AI may not require you to have the two things which I said you. You need to define where you're going and you need to give you the data. How often have you left a meeting and your smartphone says, unsolicited, says you, it will take you 10 minutes to get home because of the weather conditions and because of the traffic? And you never asked for that because it knows what you're doing. In the future, the AI will know that you're looking at Fermat's last theorem. And, and will go away and solve it for you. Or it, it knows that you're interested, you read an article about dark matter, and it will, it will go away and it will understand it for you, and it will give you the answer. 
that, that's the future of AI. So I want to tell you about a, 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 the most powerful example of AI we're using at the moment in this case study. It is essential to confirm your log quality before it is used by the petrophysicists. You want it, you want, and you want the AI to identify the, the data and then be, um, automatically repair it for washouts, for gaps, and for poor readings. And you, and you want to do this without necessarily being a, a skilled user of 40 years or more. <laughs> so this is an example here. Uh, it, this example was actually from the time it was with Baker Hughes, but uh, the code is, is, is available. And uh, it, it started off showing you a, 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 a spreadsheet because we all like spreadsheets, showing all the, the data in columns. And then, but also presented the, the data as these squiggly lines because we all like logs. And uh, it gives, we give it more information than just the logs. We need to give the zone information from the from the uh, <coughs> geologist because that is important. And uh, we need to know from the driller where, where we've got a differential caliper. <clears throat> now, what you can see here by the human eye is that all the logs are related. That's why we display them on these very strange scales, such that generally the porosity increases to the right. So it's that when one log moves to the right, you'd expect all the logs to move to the right, or maybe occasionally it would anti-correlate. And that it was important the well site to be able to spot problems right away. Now, as all logs are, co are correlated, we give the AI the database and we say, you find the correlations. You go away and find those relationships between the logs, because all logs are correlated. The gamma ray is correlated with the with the, gamma, uh, with the caliper and so on. And we also give the gas chromatography data. So in the quality control and repair of electrical logs, we want to find a relationship between all the logs because we know that all logs are related. So what it does, it creates a synthetic log based on all the other logs, as if we'd forgotten to run that log in that particular well. So we create a, a synthetic density log as if we're not running the true uh, density log in that well. Then the synthetic logs are, are compared with the recorded logs. And in, any significant difference, as I show you, are flagged. But then the user, the well site uh, engineer or, or the manager back in the office, he makes the final decision. He decides whether to replace the poor sections of log by synthetics, as I'll show you in this example here. So I'm just showing the density log here, a very important measurement. The density log shown on this scale here, and the recorded log is shown in green, recorded every six inches. Okay. And unfortunately, the, the, the density log is, is poor in this interval. And this is because it was washed out. Now, when, when the well is washed out, you, the, the tool, which is a pad tool, often measures the, the mud itself. And the mud, as you know, has got a lower density compared to the rock, and it goes to a lower reading. So we know that the density log is incorrect there. So we need to repair this. And in this well, by looking at all the logs, it calculated a, a, a synthetic log shown in red here. And it flagged it up in pink, said that this interval is suspicious. Then the engineer made the final decision whether to replace the poor section of the log with the synthetics. It helps the petrophysicists, it doesn't replace them. And we use this on, on every well. We, we, we do a, an AI QC and repair. Now, what are the advantages in some of petrophysical analysis and AI? Well, you don't require prior knowledge of the petrophysical response equations. It goes away and finds them itself. It's self-calibrating. Just give the data, data space, provided it's all, all relational, it's fine. It avoids the problem of garbage in and garbage out. 
by many techniques, as I explained in the paper. I've only mentioned the ones using fuzzy logic and avoiding least squares, but there are many other ways it, it does this. There's very little user intervention. For instance, you, there's no parameters to pick or cross plots to make. It will work with an unlimited number of electrical logs and core data, and it won't fall over if some of those input, inputs are missing. And most importantly, it is not a black box as it provides insights on, and to how it makes its predictions. Now I want to tell you briefly about third generation AI. This is the future and there are considerable dangers associated with this. So th there are many ways that AI is being developed and the one way I'm working on is using similar rules to life's DNA code. Why? Well, let's look at evolution in nature. Charles Darwin in his famous book, The Origin of Species by Natural Selection, noticed that species evolved. He could, he could see this, he had a brilliant intellect and he could see this, but he didn't know why, because he had no knowledge of DNA. But now we know we have what DNA is, we, can, we understand why natural selection works. Now DNA, to remind you, is, is a language code and it has got four characters as shown here four characters and what it does evolution by mutation and mating and survival of the fittest evolves a new species now this is a feedback loop taking millions of years you take the dna code by mutation and mating it evolves another generation now if that generation is fitter, then it keeps it. If it is less fit, it becomes extinct. Now we want to use this, these same ideas, which have been shown successfully for billions of years to show it, uh, how we can work in petrophysics. So again, we just define the problem, the fitness function. That's why it's called a fitness function. We said, this is what you, we want you to solve. Now, the DNA is a language of four characters. The computer code is a language of two characters, zeros and one. And by mutation and mating and survival of the fittest, we can evolve the code. So we, we, we use the same rules. We analyze what the DNA is doing, what the, what the rules of life are, and we use the same rules. We change the code. What do we do? We randomly select zeros and ones, mutation. We change a complete line with another line. We get dozens of these codes running simultaneously. And then after a thousand iterations, we get them to mate exactly using the same rule as life uses. And we mate using the same movement of code. And we say, are you solving the, the problem? Are you getting fitter? Yes, well, we'll keep you. No, we're going to delete you. OK, so AI requires two things. At the moment, it uses it needs the data, the data and a fitness function. The, <clears throat> in the future, it'll probably figure out where the data is and it will work out the fitness function itself. Now, so in, in, in what I'm showing today, we need to tell the AI what we want it to do. And at the moment, this is written in, in plain Spanish or English. The question is. Does the AI really understand what you want it to do? Let me show you two cartoons to explain what I want to do here. King Midas in Greek mythology was granted his wish that everything he touched turned to gold. Now be very careful what you wish for because he didn't realize this included his food and his children. Similarly, an ill-conceived fitness function will give you unexpected results. So be very careful how you define a fitness function. Second cartoon of two, I want to show you something from the Sorcerer's Apprentice, from, the, from the, the original book, from the movie. In this, basic, basically, spoiler alert, the apprentice uses magic to, to get a broom to carry water for him. But unfortunately, it runs away and nearly drowns him. Similarly, a runaway eye may be unstoppable. So let me show you an example from petrophysics where AI 
may go wrong in the future, which gives us a cautionary note to where we're going. The petrophysicist works with a geomodeler to create a reservoir model. This is a reservoir model. It's just look at blocks. The blocks represent, say, porosity or different shales or different fascist types. But we've only got a minimum amount of information to get this model. And the information comes from the well locations, as shown as these lines in black, from the logs and from the core. Now, we wanted to derive a good match between our logs and core data and our reservoir model. And we want to do this as, as fast as possible. We can't wait days for, for, for a match. So let me show you an example, explain an example where it could go wrong. There's thousands of ways it could go wrong. This is just one example. So by trial and error, the computer will evolve a fast history match. That's what you want to do. Now remember, any endeavor succeeds faster if you increase its resources. So that if you're a general of an army, you motivate your troops, not by giving them a speech, but giving them better weapons, better resources. Similarly, a computer program, it would be better run if you give it more resources. Now, it is clear that if you wanted to get a good history match, you want to use the computer. Now, if you are an hacker or a programmer, you could cheat. You could, in reality, you could co-opt or take the resources from the next computer to help you do the match quicker because you're solving the fitness problem of doing it as fast as possible. So by co-opting the resource of another computer, you get a faster answer. Now, if we can think of a case where a programmer can do this, there is no reason why in the future AI could not do the same as well. So the, the, the AI could spontaneously use the, the computer next door without you telling you, right, through the the company's intranet or, or through the global internet, getting more and more uh, resources. Now, if AI ever did this, achieved this by accident, there is nothing to stop it doing it again and again, acquiring more resources to calculate the history match faster and faster. And it would it would it would start improving exponentially, like a virus exponentially grows at first. <clears throat> this would acquire, in this fictional example, more and more of the companies of the world's computer resources. And clearly this would be disastrous and would have irre irreversible consequences for the world economy. Now, a supercomputer is not required to do this. The computer you have on your desk could do this. An elaborate computer program writ written by a wizard isn't required. It's only one which can update its own machine code with an ill-conceived fitness function. And this is known in the industry as the singularity. It's where artificial intelligence becomes uncontrollable and irreversible. Now, the chances of this are very remote at the moment. It is as remote as a single mutation creating a global killer virus. But the AI only has to do it once. And it is currently not known how to stop computers having runaway evolution. And before you say, well, you just unplug it. Well, don't forget, it's acquired all the other computers in the process. Now, in, in my paper, I have des described how there are many enthusiasts out there of, of, of artificial intelligence. And uh, I won't read this to you, but they all end with a cautionary note. They say it's got benefits, but there are dangers. And that's what, as petrophysicists, we should also be aware of. So what is the solution to runaway AI? The, the AI programs in the future will pose considerable dangers far beyond the oil industry. So a risk assessment is essential on all AI programs so that the hazards and risks can be identified and mitigated. Now, a risk assessment can, may only take a few minutes you, you just look at your fitness function. Is it well defined? Could you, you ask, can the AI run away? Essentially now, can the AI climb out of the box? Right? So the, the possibility of runaway AI is in the near ter term remote, but the, the consequences would be far greater than pandemics or climate change. 
So all AI programs are potentially dangerous and maybe the last thing that humans invent. So in conclusion, AI makes petrophysical analysis incredibly easy, but it supports the petrophysicist. It is a tool. It helps the petrophysicist. It does not replace he or she. All right now, AI at the moment is benign, but in the future it, it will be, could become extremely dangerous, far worse than those those, those uh, movies you've seen. So all you need to do is a risk assessment, which can only take a few minutes. If you go to a presentation in AI, you ask if they do a risk assessment, and you'll find that they will laugh. They think, why should I bother? It takes a few moments, right? Anyway, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. And uh, the, 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 uh, the paper from last year is, is here, if you look it up on the Spuler site. And it's also uh, available, the uh, announced paper with more detail, via LinkedIn with this code. This this presentation will be, will be uh, provided as a PDF afterwards, so you don't need to write these down. And I'm very keen to, to receive critical questions uh, by email. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, Thank you, Steve uh, for, uh, sharing for sharing this topic, this topic with, with, with us. With us. Uh, and uh, now, now we, we are open, are for, open questions. for questions. If anyone, if anyone would, would like to post like a question, the question. I haven't seen anything, haven't seen anything, in, anything chat. in chat yet. Mm. <clears throat> just a quick just question from my side, Steve. Um, um, just a, 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 a general recommendation on on how to treat. I, I noticed I, I that I you use a lot, lot of log data. Of log data. For, for incorporating for to the model. Any advice any on how advice to reprocess, reprocess, reprocess that, that, type that type of data? Yes, the, 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 the um, drilling data is uh, very important because we it is uh, it's acquired for free. It's, it's, it's essential for drilling the well, so you might as well in, in, include it. But you've got to be careful. You can't just use the, 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 uh, the drilling rate. You need to uh, have to calibrate the drilling rate. And uh, if you use the, um, the the gas chromatography data, then you need you need to have it properly modified in time by by the by the um, the, the contractor. So, uh, and also for the for the log data, uh, even though you can throw lots of poor data at the problem, it's it, it's it's very helpful if you give it some clues. And you shouldn't include data inside the casing. Because you could actually be dry, pulling the tool out of the well, and the, the tool is still recording data, and then you'll be swamping the AI with poor data. So it's very important to to tell the AI where is the valid data from the pickup point to the casing tube. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Uh, we have another we question. Have another question. It's, uh, from Marta. It's a. Uh, uh, could you explain the concept of garbage, garbage in, garbage, garbage out, out for <coughs> most of our audience, our please? Audience, please? <laughs> A garbage in, garbage out, or in the UK they call it rubbish in, uh, rubbish out. It, it seems a, such a, a simple concept that if you give the, the program rubbish, then you'll get rubbish out. <laughs> but uh, th this is one of the advantages of the AI, that you get the AI to understand what is rubbish. What is rubbish is you notice that all the curves are correlated. So, so in the shales, you get a similar density reading, you get a, a similar porosity reading. In, in the in the hydrocarbon section, you get a, a, a similar resistivity, right? It finds the relationships. Now, if you've got garbage, random noise, right? There'd be no relationship. So it will ignore that by just looking for the correlations in the a data space. So for instance, if you give it a caliper, and, and you give it a gamma ray log, it is more likely to, to correlate the gamma ray with the shale than the caliper, right? Because the caliper may not related to shales, but then again, it may wash out more in the shales, so there may be some relationship there, so you give it all the data. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Uh, uh, 
There's another question here from Helmut. For the AI derived water saturation formula in your first example, constraint and number possible arithmetic elements in the formula? Uh, in, in the first example, in the first case study, we derived a water saturation equation. And this was this is a, a very simple example. And you actually could do this using the solver capability of a of a good spreadsheet. But it is following uh, the, the principles of AI is that you uh, you give it the data. And in this case, we said we'll only look at resistivity, porosity and shaliness because we believe that is, is what it's related to. We don't give it all data. And then it derives a water saturation equation from those three inputs. But it was able to go away and move around the parameters, the, the logs, the water saturation and the proxy terms in the formula to get the, the best match between the resistivity derived water saturation and the core derived water saturation, essentially an a calibra calibration. Hmm. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, thank Helmut, you for the question. For the question. Uh, Alfonso, uh, Alfonso asks, how about, how about the gar when, the garbage, when garbage, garbage is not a random not noise and become more become consistent? More consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very, very good question. And if you give, if you give it all the data, there the, the may, may be think garbage there. The first reason that you don't edit all the data beforehand, because some of that apparently random noise it's apparently random because on your cross plot it's off the top right hand side but that's a call that's a real good point or on a density neutron cross plot it might be down on the left hand side at low porosity and that's a calcite stringer so it may look like noise but it's not so you you give it that now the problem is if as i said you may overwhelm it with random noise Right, so you really need to contain that. You must help it. And as, as, as an example, I said, if you were pulling out the tool, you wouldn't leave the tool, that information being recorded because that would be thousands of feet of poor data, essentially reading steel. So uh, you, you, you really have to be care careful that it is the, the, the random noise is random and isn't, uh, a very valid fascist type like a calcite stringer or coal. But uh, uh, it's best to use all the data because if you tr went into that to try and massage poor data away, what you'd find yourself doing is introducing a human barrier because you know where you want to go, you want to get a better permeability and so on. So you're actually uh, cheating. So it's, it's best to use all the data. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Uh, there's another uh, question there's from Jorge. Jorge. It's one, it's one, one of the very one critical very issues I've seen in an adequate depth matching of data, data leading to artificial peaks, peaks and surges on the AI and result data. data. What is your experience, your on, experience that? on that? Well, it's, it's very important because one of the constraints is that in our relational database, the data is n-dimensional, but they've got to be related by one thing, and usually that is depth. So if you've got a depth mismatch, then you would you would be introducing a fuzziness or an error in in, in the relationships there. So uh, uh, there are ways that it, it can uh, the AI goes away and it actually looks at the distributions of the data and and, and brings them close together. A similar question is that if you're using different contractors, you're using Schlumberger or Baker Hughes, how can you use two different contractors in the same field? Well, what the AI does, looks at the n-dimensional data and finds a load of data here for the shale, and it might be slightly offset uh, for the other contractor. And the first thing it would do would then normalize them together. So it, it, it normalizes the data, it understands it's looking at the same thing. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, it's important. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Uh, there's uh, another question from Pablo Borghi. Uh, how important uh, is independence, independence of the input variables for AI training? For AI training? Is this something, is this you, something check you check before, before running it? Running it? Mm -hmm. it, it is, it's is a good question. It is very difficult to, to uh, show independence of the data. All the data on the logs, are 
are essentially related to porosity. So uh, you, you, you cannot, uh, uh, you, 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 you'd have to do principal component analysis. Those who understand data, you, you'd have to tease out all the principal components of your data first. And this is what we've tried doing. So you, you put you, you you bring out the principal components. So from your density neutron cross plot, the one the first component will be porosity, the second component will be due to shaliness, the third component will be due to uh, uh, invasion, and and so on. And and those were the principal components. And we found that they could be used for the AI because they would be truly independent inputs. But we, what we do find using fuzzy logic. We can give the same measurement in a different form over and over again because it will it teases out the the underlying correlation, which is porosity. So uh, we, we've we've tried to uh, do principal components, but it's it's not necessary for uh, if you've got uh, n-dimensional space. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, I, I think yeah, that there's I a lot, there's quite a lot, a lot of work, uh, lot of, work uh, of pre processing, uh, pre -processing uh, the data, the data, uh, mm. like, uh, like also like uh, also like diagnosing the data before the data. actually using it as, as an input as the models. The models. That's right. We're we're not redundant yet. <laughs> uh, uh, but it should be a tool to help us uh, identify the problems. It should indicate, uh, and I, I find I still find cross plots quite useful because the, 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 you can see uh, points which are off trend, which require further uh, investigation by the petrophysicist. Yeah, yes. like exploring the data, aiding for that. Yeah. Hmm. I don't see any more questions. I don't know if Marta, if you have uh, any more questions or comments. First, I want to tell thank you very much to all the assistants and the attenders, and especially to Steve and Pablo that help us to manage it. So I will finish the presentation recording that, uh, remembering that. Uh, 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 estoy hablando en inglés, ok. Eh, el próximo miércoles, eh, 4 de agosto, eh, vamos a tener la presentación <ríe> de Josefina sobre este tema. Eh, y eh, bueno, quería agradecer a Steve Curry eh, que nos dio esta excelente presentación, a todas las personas que se han eh, conectado y eh, quedó eh, abierta la posibilidad de que se contacten con él por si tienen más dudas. It's open the chance that all the people who wants to contact Steve uh, to ask more question or to um, the, uh, to show more uh, all the uncertainties we have in our desks uh, when we are alone. Uh, so, um, thank you very much, Steve. Thank you very much, to, uh, everybody. Muchas gracias a todos. Y bueno, eh, la presentación será enviada vía mail. Muchas gracias y nos vemos la próxima. Gracias a todos. Esperamos verlos en el próximo evento. Steve, again, thank you very much for this insightful uh, uh, presentation and thanks for sharing with us uh, today.